adapted from archaic translation by H. T. Francis and Ra. Neil. Jataka No. 356. Karandia Jataka. Why in forest, etc. This was a story told by the Master while living at Jetavana Monastery, concerning the Captain of the Faith. That elder monk. They say. When wicked folk came to him, such as hunters, fishermen and the like, laid down the moral law to them, and any others that he might see from time to time, saying, Receive you the righteous path. Through respect for the elder monk, they could not disobey his words and accepted the righteous path, but failed to keep it, and still followed each after his own business. The elder monk took advice with his fellow monks and said, Sirs, these men receive the righteous path from me, but keep it not. They answered, Holy Sir, you preach the righteous path to them against their wishes, and as they dare not disobey what you tell them, they accept it. From now on lay not down the righteous path to such as these. The elder monk was offended. On hearing of the incident they started a discussion in the Hall of Truth, how that the elder monk Saraputra preached the righteous path to any that he happened to see. The master came and inquired what was the topic that the brethren were debating in their assembly. And on hearing what it was, he said, Not now only, brethren, but formerly also he preached the righteous path to any men he might chance to see even though they did not ask for it. And with this he told a story of the past. Once upon a time when Brahmadatta reigned in Banaras, the Bodhisattva was born and grew up in a Brahman household, and became the chief pupil of a world-famed teacher at Taxila. At that time this teacher preached the moral law to anyone that he might see, fishermen and the like, even if they did not want it repeatedly asking them receive the righteous path. But though they received it, they kept it not. The teacher spoke of it to his disciples. His disciples said, Holy Sir, you preach to them against their wishes, and therefore they break the law. From now on preach only to those who wish to hear you, and not to those who do not wish. The teacher was filled with regret but even so he still laid down the law to all whom he happened to see. Now one day some people came from a certain village and invited the teacher to eat the cakes offered to Brahmins. He summoned his disciple named Karandia and said, My dear son, I am not going, but you are to go there with these five hundred disciples, and receive the cakes, and bring the portion that falls to my share. So he sent him. The disciple went, and as he was returning, he noticed on the road a cave, and the thought struck him, Our master lays down the righteous path, without being asked, to all that he sees. From now on I will cause him to preach only to those that wish to hear him. And while the other disciples were comfortably seated, he arose and picking up a huge stone, threw it into the cave and again and again repeated the action. Then the disciples stood up and said, Sir, what are you doing? Karandia said not a word. And they went in haste and told their master. The master came and in conversing with Karandia repeated the first stanza. Why in forest all alone? Seizing often a mighty stone. Did you hurl it with a will? mountain cave as it was to fill. Dot. On hearing his words, Karandia to stir up his master uttered the second stanza. I would make this sea surrounded land. Smooth as palm of human hand. Dot. Thus I level knoll and hill. And with stones each hollow fill. The Brahman, on hearing this, repeated the third stanza. Never a one of mortal birth has the power to level earth. Scarce Karandia can hope with a single cave to cope. The disciple, on hearing this, spoke the fourth stanza. 
if a man of mortal birth has no power to level earth, wrong believers may well refuse Brahman to adopt your views. On hearing this the teacher made an appropriate reply, for he now recognized that other men might differ from him, and thinking, I will no longer act thus, he uttered the fifth stanza. Friend Karandia, in short, for my good you do advice. Dot. Earth can never leveled be. Neither can all men agree. Thus did the teacher sing the praises of his disciple. And he, after he had thus addressed his teacher, took him home. The master, having ended this lesson, identified the birth. At that time Saraputra was the Brahman, and I myself was the disciple Karandiya. Source. Adapted from archaic translation by H. T. Francis and Ra. Neil. Jataka No. 357. Latukika Jataka. Elephant of sixty years, etc. This was a story told by the master while living in the bamboo grove, concerning Devadatta. One day they raised a discussion in the Hall of Truth, saying, Sirs, Devadatta is harsh, cruel, and violent. He has not an atom of pity for mortals. When the master came, he inquired what was the topic the brethren were assembled to discuss, and on hearing what it was, he said, Brethren, not now only, but formerly also he was pitiless. And with this he told a story of the past. Once upon a time when Brahmadatta was reigning in Banaras, the Bodhisattva came to life as a young elephant, and growing up a fine handsome beast, he became the leader of the herd, with a following of 80,000 elephants, and lived in the Himalayas. At that time a quail laid her eggs in the feeding ground of the elephants. When the eggs were ready to be hatched, the young birds broke the shells and came out. Before their wings had grown, and when they were still unable to fly, the great being with his following of 80,000 elephants, in searching about for food, came to this spot. On seeing him the quail thought, this royal elephant will trample on my young ones and kill them. Lo! I will implore his righteous protection for the defense of my young. Then she raised her two wings and standing before him repeated the first stanza. Elephant of sixty years. Forest lord amongst your equals. I am but a puny bird. You a leader of the herd. Dot. With my wings I do my act of homage pay. Spare my little ones, I pray. The great being said, O quail, be not troubled. I will protect your offspring. And standing over the young birds, while the eighty thousand elephants passed by, he thus addressed the quail. Behind us comes a solitary rogue elephant. He will not do our asking. When he comes, do you plead him too, and so ensure the safety of your offspring? And with these words he made off. And the quail went on to meet the other elephant, and with both wings uplifted, making respectful salutation, she spoke the second stanza. Roaming over hill and valley, cherishing your lonely way, you, O forest king, I hail and with wings my act of homage pay. I am but a miserable quail. Spare my tender young to kill. On hearing her words, the elephant spoke the third stanza. I will kill your young ones, quail. Dot. What can your poor help avail? Dot. My left foot can crush with ease. Many thousand birds like these. And so saying, with his foot he crushed the young birds to atoms, and excreted over them washed him away in a flood of water, and went off loudly trumpeting. The quail sat down on the branch of a tree and said, Then be off with you and trumpet away. You shall very soon see what I will do. You little know what a difference there is between strength of body and strength of mind. 
Well, I will teach you this lesson. And thus threatening him she repeated the fourth stanza. Power abused is not all gain. Power is often wrongdoing's weakness. Beast that did my young ones kill. I will work you mischief still. And so saying, shortly afterwards she did a good turn to a crow, and when the crow, who was highly pleased, asked, What can I do for you? The quail said, There is nothing else, sir, to be done, but I shall expect you to strike with your beak and to peck out the eyes of this rogue elephant. The crow readily agreed, and the quail then did a service to a blue fly, and when the fly asked, What can I do for you? She said, When the eyes of this rogue elephant have been put out by the crow, then I want you to let fall eggs upon them. The fly agreed. And then the quail did a kindness to a frog. And when the frog asked what it was to do, she said, when this rogue elephant becomes blind, and shall be searching for water to drink, then take your stand and utter a croak on the top of a mountain, and when he has climbed to the top, come down and croak again at the bottom of the precipice. This much I shall look for at your hands. After hearing what the quail said, the frog readily agreed. So one day the crow with its beak pecked out both the eyes of the elephant. And the fly dropped its eggs upon him, and the elephant being eaten up with maggots was maddened by the pain, and overcome with thirst wandered about seeking for water to drink. At this moment the frog standing on the top of a mountain uttered a croak. Thought the elephant, there must be water there, and climbed up the mountain. Then the frog descended, and standing at the bottom croaked again. The elephant thought, there will be water there and moved forward towards the precipice, and rolling over fell to the bottom of the mountain and was killed. When the quail knew that the elephant was dead, she said, I have seen the back of mine enemy, and in a high state of delight moved about over his body, and passed away to fare according to her deeds. The master said, Brethren, one should not incur the hostility of anyone. These four creatures, by combining together, brought about the destruction of this elephant, strong as he was. A quail with crow, blue fly and frog allied. Once proved the issue of a deadly feud. Through them King Elephant untimely died. Dot. Therefore all quarrelling should be avoided. Uttering this stanza inspired by perfect wisdom, he thus identified the birth. At that time Devadatta was the rogue elephant, and I myself was the leader of the herd of elephants. Source. Adapted from archaic translation by H. T. Francis and Ra. Neil. Jataka No. 358. Kaladharmapala Jataka. Mahapatapa's Miserable Queen, etc. This story the master, when living in the bamboo grove, told concerning the going about of Devadatta to kill the Bodhisattva. In all other births Devadatta failed to excite so much as an atom of fear in the Bodhisattva. But in the Kaladharmapala birth, when the Bodhisattva was only seven months old, he had his hands and feet and head cut off and his body encircled with sword cuts, as it were with a garland. In the Dadara birth he killed him by twisting his neck, and roasted his flesh in an oven and ate it. In the Kantavadi birth he had him lashed with two thousand strokes of a whip, and ordered his hands and feet and ears and nose to be cut off and then had him seized by the hair of his head and dragged along. And when he was stretched at full length on his back, he kicked him in the belly and made off, and that very day the Bodhisattva died. But both in the Kalanandaka and the Vivatiyakarpi births he merely had him put to death. Thus did Devadatta for a long time go about to kill him, and continued to do so, even after he became a Buddha.
So one day they raised a discussion in the Hall of Truth, saying, Sirs, Devadatta is continually forming plots to kill the Buddha. Thinking to kill the Supreme Buddha, he bribed archers to shoot him. He threw down a rock upon him, and let loose the elephant Nalagiri on him. When the master came and inquired what subject the brethren were assembled to discuss. On hearing what it was he said, Brethren, not now only, but formerly too he went about to kill me. But now he fails to excite a particle of fear in me. Though formerly when I was Prince Dharmapala he brought about my death, though I was his own son, by encircling my body with sword cuts, as it were with a garland. And so saying, he told a story of the past. Once upon a time when Mahapatapa was reigning in Banaras, the Bodhisattva came to life as the son of his queen wife Chanda, and they named him Dharmapala. When he was seven months old, his mother had him bathed in scented water and richly dressed and sat playing with him. The king came to the place of her dwelling. And as she was playing with the boy, being filled with a mother's love for her child, she omitted to rise up on seeing the king. He thought, Even now this woman is filled with pride on account of her boy, and does not value me a straw. But as the boy grows up, she will think, I have a man for my son, and will take no notice of me. I will have him put to death at once. So he returned home, and sitting on his throne summoned the executioner into his presence, with all the instruments of his office. The man put on his yellow robe and wearing a crimson wreath laid his axe upon his shoulder. And carrying a block and a bowl in his hands, came and stood before the king, and saluting him said, What is your will, sire? Dot. Go to the royal chamber of the queen, and bring here Dharmapala, said the king. But the queen knew that the king had left her in a rage, and laid the bodhisattva on her bosom and sat weeping. The executioner came and giving her a blow in the back snatched the boy out of her arms and took him to the king and said, What is your will, sire? The king had a board brought and put down before him, and said, Lay him down on it. The man did so. But Queen Chanda came and stood just behind her son, weeping. Again the executioner said, What is your will, sire? Cut off Dharmapala's hands, said the king. Queen Chanda said, Great king, my boy is only a child, seven months old. He knows nothing. The fault is not his. If there be any fault, it is mine. Therefore ask my hands to be cut off. And to make her meaning clear, she uttered the first stanza. Mahapatapa's miserable queen. It is I alone to blame have been. Ask Dharmapala, sire, to go free. And off with hands of luckless me. The king looked at the executioner. What is your will, sire? Without further delay, off with his hands, said the king. At this moment the executioner took a sharp axe, and chopped off the boy's two hands, as if they had been young bamboo shoots. The boy, when his hands were cut off, neither wept nor mourned, but moved by patience and charity endured it with resignation. But the Queen Chanda put the tips of his fingers in her lap and stained with blood went about mourning. Again the executioner asked, What is your will, sire? Off with his feet, said the king. On hearing this, Chanda uttered the second stanza. Mahapatapa's miserable queen. It is I alone to blame have been. Ask Dharmapala, sire, to go free and off with feet of luckless me. But the king gave a sign to the executioner, and he cut off both his feet. Queen Chanda put his feet also in her lap, and stained with blood, mourned and said, My lord Mahapatapa, his feet and hands are cut off. 
A mother is bound to support her children. I will work for wages and support my son. Give him to me. The executioner said, Sire, is the king's desire fulfilled? Is my service finished? Not yet, said the king. What then is your will, sire? Off with his head, said the king. Then Chanda repeated the third stanza. Mahapatapa's miserable queen. It is I alone to blame have been. Ask Dharmapala, sire, to go free. And off with head of luckless me. And with these words she offered her own head. Again the executioner asked, What is your will, sire? Off with his head, said the king. So he cut off his head and asked, Is the king's desire fulfilled? Not yet, said the king. What further am I to do, sire? Catching him with the edge of the sword, said the king, Encircle him with sword cuts as it were with a garland. Then he threw the body of the boy up into the air, and catching it with the edge of his sword, encircled him with sword cuts, as it were with a garland, and scattered the bits on the dais. Chanda placed the flesh of the Bodhisattva in her lap, and as she sat on the dais morning, she repeated these stanzas. No friendly counsellors advise the king. Kill not the air that from your loins did spring. Dot. No loving kinsman urge the tender plea. Kill not the boy that owes his life to you. Moreover, after speaking these two stanzas, Queen Chanda, pressing both her hands upon her heart, repeated the third stanza. You, Dharmapala, were by right of birth. The Lord of Earth. Dot. Your arms, once bathed in oil of sandal wood lie steeped in blood. My fitful breath, alas, is choked with sighs and broken cries. While she was thus mourning, her heart broke, as a bamboo snaps, when the grove is on fire, and she fell dead on the spot. The king too being unable to remain on his throne fell down on the dais. An abyss was split apart in the ground, and straightway he fell into it. Then the solid earth, though many times more than two hundred thousand leagues in thickness, being unable to bear with his wickedness, split apart and opened a chasm. A flame arose out of the Avici hell, and seizing upon him, wrapped him about, as with a royal woolen garment, and plunged him into Avici. His ministers performed the funeral rites of Chanda and the Bodhisattva. The master, having brought this discourse to an end, identified the birth. At that time Devadatta was the king, Mahapayapati was Chanda, and I myself was Prince Dharmapala.